Welcome to Navarra Media on the eve of the most significant election of our generation. I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Loki, Thank you for whose music has been raising consciousness about politics, British foreign policy for over a decade, and who Thank is you. now one of the many artists who have come out in favour of Corbyn to have mm -hmm. energised this movement. I hope so. Uh, I want to know what inspired you, what brought you to mm -hmm. come out so strongly in favour of of Corbyn this time around? What Jeremy Corbyn represents is an uh, alternative to neoliberalism, and that's important because that uh, economic philosophy became prevalent um, and uniform across the political class. There were exceptions um, on individual levels, but he is the first person to really be driven and, and propelled into the position he's in, in spite of his party, by this um, exasperation, but also opposition um, and rejection of neoliberalism. I believe we can win, I believe we will win, mm -hmm. but even if we don't, two things are clear. The political class, which has remained servile to neoliberalism for these years, you know, neoliberalism is discredited, it's bankrupt, it doesn't work, it doesn't, as Stiglitz has pointed out, it leads to more inequality. Mm -hmm. Trickle down is a lie, the mythology of it is completely discredited. They can't go back now. And secondly, in terms of access to information, in terms of uh, uh, the sort of potentialities to organize, they can't limit it again. They can't limit it the same way they used to be able to. So you're hopeful they can't about repress. Completely the disruptive hopeful. potential of technology and inspired. to keep this going. And inspired. It can't be shut down. And inspired. Completely. Yeah. And completely inspired. Because neoliberalism, it hides within the anonymity and the ambiguity of bureaucracy. So if you're a disabled person who receives benefits and needs them to live, and it's the difference between you eating three meals a day and living off milk, for instance, mm -hmm. when you're... Um, when your allowance is cut, who are you able to blame? There is not a, 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 a tangible force in front of you that you can blame. Mm -hmm. It's the mythology of the artificial state. It's arrangements. That, so they hide b behind the bureaucracy of it. They hide in the anonymity of it. And it's that anonymity which is absolutely being exposed and is absolutely being taken to task now, as never before. And it's been exposed where you see it's been exposed on social media or in new technologies and also by Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, By people right? like you. By people like what oh, you thanks. guys do and the, and the vital function that is served by this. You know, it's quite hard for us to view this in its totality mm -hmm. because we're living in it. We're part of it while it's happening. And it's very um, spontaneous. However, what this period of time will stand as, historically, is a time of a greater participation mm -hmm. in political decision-making. Yep. That's what will happen, whether they like it or not. I want to ask you about participation because... Yep. Well, you, you, you're an artist, you're also an intellectual, you've been on the left for, for, very kind. for a decade. <laughs> very but what, kind. I, what I mean is that you know, you've, you're part of a left milieu that have been speaking about neoliberalism, mm. uh, IMF loans in the 80s, mm. things like this for, for a while, mm -hmm. and a critique that's often been thrown at the left mm -hmm. or a potential source of sort of like self-doubt we've had is yeah. do ordinary people understand this language? Yeah. Like, politics is my hobby, it's yeah. to an extent like it's not a hobby, but you know, it's, it's, yeah. I spend more hours of the day thinking about politics than most people do. I think one thing that this, that Corbyn's leadership, or especially the last two weeks of this general election, have yeah. surprised lots of us on the left, yeah, yeah. is that something is cutting through to a much broader section yeah. of society, especially young people than we were told was possible. Yeah. I mean, what do you think, what, what for you explains that? The reason for that change in the mood has been that in the law in this country, they are absolutely obliged to give equal time to each party to represent their own ideas. Now, the corporate media has up until now mm -hmm. been falling over itself to represent and misrepresent Jeremy Corbyn's ideas and to ostracize him and to otherize him and to put him outside of his unelectable, to create that mantra in people's heads. But now Jeremy's discourse has been able to get through and people have really been able to see that it's actually a very clear choice it is a choice between people dying in old age, alone and cold, unable to pay their electricity bills, or people being able to live. It's a choice between people being able to go to university mm -hmm. or people being ensnared in into debt, of which 75% of them will die without paying. It is a choice between people going to school and being fed and not. It is a choice between family members going into hospital, being treated, and being able to live and people not mm -hmm. being able to live. And that's important. I think the energy of the campaign in the last few weeks has partly been, as you said, because Corbyn can speak 
directly to people. Mm. It's also been because there's been a kind of a groundswell of sort mm. of cultural leaders, artists, especially young artists, coming out in support of him. Mm. Um, with, with, with yourself, mm -hmm. sort of like the difference between what you've done before is, is the electoral politics element of mm. it. Like you've, you've always done politics. Mm. Uh, we've also seen, we've seen lots of people come out who we may not have associated with, yeah. with the left, yeah. in, in inverted commas, before mm. JME, Stormzy. Mm -hmm. like, did that surprise you? No, um, because generally the celebrity class is overpaid and underuseful. In, in critical political moments. That's yeah. my reading of it. They're superficial, they're very much concentrated on the aesthetics of situations. I'm not in any way directing that towards Jamie Stormzy or any of the rappers mentioned. I'm really generally actually directing that more at the kind of, you know, Hollywood, the way that yeah. Hollywood is very, it's very corporatized and it very easily can, you know, fall into bed with certain political interests. We've seen it repeatedly throughout history. It's nothing new. But in terms of what's happening now with uh, Jeremy Corbyn, is everyone comes from a cer certain socio-economic situation. And when they look at a situation, they would say either, what kind of society would I ideally like to live in? Or they look at it and say, what's actually going to affect the mm -hmm. lived realities of members of my family? Yep. And it's that that has resonance with people. And you think Corbyn successfully cut through as someone who is for your family? Not well, for it's corporate interests, basically, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, and that's what people want. People are sick of it. Yeah. People are sick of service to corporate interests. People are sick of having politics subjugated to economics. They're sick of, 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 of having vital services within the society cut while arms sales are subsidised, while bankers are subsidised. They're sick of it. They don't want it anymore. Do you think this movement can last? Yeah, so, I mean, and it will build. You think it will last? So, so we've got one option, which is... Corbyn will, wins, Labour going to government, the establishment are trying yeah. to crush down the subversive yeah. elements of yeah. that. And of the that deeper state, government. the deeper state will come yeah. into it, as you know, the statement that came yeah. out from someone high ranking in the army, I think 2015, implying in oh, some yeah, ways that, that there would be mechanisms elected, against yeah. him. And, and without a doubt, and moreover, he's going to come under pressures, but the important thing, and the point I was trying to make before, was that he's receptive to social movements mm -hmm. in a way that the anonymity of bureaucracy isn't. I mean, if he, if he loses, the level, there's yeah. also going to be an attempt to close this movement down, yeah, probably yeah, yeah. from within the PLP, from within oppression. the Labour That's Party. That's the way these things always seem to work. There's attempts to co-opt uh, subversive mm -hmm. ideas and thinkers and, and people active in that way, or to repress them. And they will repress them through the attempt to neutralise them through the corporate media, you know, there's all types of different ways. And, and the methods. energy that's been mobilised for this particular election, yeah. how do you see that carrying on I don't see it in the months and years? I don't see it dissipating. And what forms do you think that will take? Do you see people joining the Labour Party, for example? Well, I mean, I see people, at least from what he's done, is he's been steering the discourse in a way yeah. that it's never been steered before. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have been steered there by Owen Smith. It was never steered there by uh, Miliband. Mm -hmm. But Corbyn has done that. You know, because also he's a product of these movements. You know, and like I say, he's been propelled by them, not the other way round. Mm -hmm. He's been propelled by them, not the other way round. And so it's important that we get away from this uh, personalization of mm -hmm. politics, from this sort of where you isolate people and atomize the situation. And what we like to do, it seems, is have martyrs historically that we then idealize and sort of in a nostalgic way begin to worship and say, well, yeah, they understood it but they were part of specific movements at specific times that were organizing for specific aims. And that's what he is. He has, has been thrust mm -hmm. by people. Do you think people. it's surprising that the guy who has been thrust that's mobilized yeah. all these young people, mm -hmm. diverse, yeah. urban, from inner cities, thousands of people, thousands of kids running yeah. up hills to watch this guy speak. He's yeah. like an old white guy. Mm. Do you think that's surprising or? No, because I think it's about the strength of his ideas. Yeah. I think it's about the strength of ideas. And I, I think this aestheticism is, is, is not... I mean, obviously, you know, he has a willingness and a humility to listen mm -hmm. and to attempt, even if he can't, to understand other people's experiences. And that's the core of it. That's all you can ask from someone, is a willingness to listen. And so I think that it's that humility which has served him greatly. Mm. I want to get into the best case scenario, which is that yeah. Corbyn wins yeah. on Thursday. I think this is going to go out. We're, it's Tuesday today. This is going to go out tomorrow, the day before the election. 
So imagine, come when we wake up on Friday, yeah. Corbyn is Prime Minister. Yeah. What are the first things you want to see him do? Oof, let's, well, have, let's have three. The three well, things you care most about. Definitely the tuition fees issue. Yeah. I would also like to see him, as he said, aim to ameliorate the pe issue of people in debt from that. Um, there's so many things. There's so many things. I mean, as I've said, one of them would be to lessen the influence of the uh, military industrial complex yeah. and stand up to them, you know, and say we don't see why the taxpayer should be subsidising um, what it is that you do. Um, I also do find his uh, discourse on the issue of mental health really re uh, refreshing, actually really refreshing, because it's bringing in a humanity to the way that we interact with each other as a society. You know, he is attempting and has put forth a plan to build a society which is more cohesive mm -hmm. and which is more, um, more harmonious, but also is far less alienated and far less divided by chasms of estrangement. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I see him moving in that direction, but I like the, the attention that he's giving to these issues of mental health. And I also think, you know, when we look at our demographics, you know, I'm not necessarily sure of your age, but I think... 27. Our, yeah, so I think <laughs> our demographics, the thing that we're most likely to be killed by is ourselves, right? And I think that that talks to the... Um, and is symptomatic of this culture whereby images have become so prevalent and where we so often um, mutilate our emotional expression and limit the width to define ourselves. And we take in these mantras of, of be a man, which are essentially about that psychological mutilation and that emotional limiting. And I think finding a way to deal with people, and also because it's about aspiring to unrealistic um, ideas of mm -hmm. what it means to be human. And, and I think that having a... A leader who doesn't a aim to exude strength as well, right? Oh, of course, yeah, so of someone course. someone who's willing to say, this fetishization I'm happy to lead, of, uh, I'm happy to listen, I don't have to know all the answers. Also, also this fetishization yeah. of violence, and this is being a, a measurement of manhood, of how you can apply violence to other people. And I think that he understands societal trends. Mm -hmm. So the things that he's putting in place five years later, we will see them in the eyes of younger members of our family or younger members of our community. We will see them having benefited from, for instance, the culture fund that they're mm -hmm. setting up. We will see them having benefited from this and having, you know, we are, all of us, born into conditions which are not of our choosing. But we have the potentiality to, to interact with them in certain ways. And I think that, like I say, He's been propelled by people like him and like-minded people that are working on a more functional, a kinder, a more uh, a society guided more by empathy, guided more, not just by justice. I would definitely like, this is the third one, 100%, mm -hmm. is address the, the climate in a okay, major yeah. way and to, and to really take the fossil fuel companies to task over it and to address the issue of fracking, you know, and... and, and and really take on Trump in that regard mm. as well also, because I think that what we're looking at is we're looking at the future of the human species, and that overrides uh, everything else, really. But also what I would love for him to do, and this is something that he's spoken about previously, is curriculumizing the study of the British Empire. So when we look at you know, this small part of the world that's made up of people that have their roots in uh, Celtic origins, Anglo-Saxon origins, Gaul, uh, Gaulish origins, Roman origins, um, Norman origins from 1066 when William the Conqueror invaded. This amalgamation of people that unite under this flag of Britishhood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by 1914, it occupied 12,700,000 miles of the planet in a non contiguous empire. What that meant for the rest of the world and the legacies that people unknowingly inherited and whether it's collective amnesia or whether it is a purposeful miseducation there are ramifications of it and people are living uh, 
proof of the damage that was done, whether it was the Durand line between Afghanistan and India at that time separating Pashtun people, whether it was the complete erasure of the Tasmanian population um, when the British arrived, whether it was the opium wars in China, whether it was the Bengal famines, mm -hmm. whether it was the Irish potato famine, whether it was sykes Pico, whether it was the Balfour Declaration. These are important parts of history for even, even if just anecdotally, for people born here to learn, both children of diaspora, but also people that consider themselves indigenous or native to this mm -hmm. place, they should also learn because it will then enable us, and this is the great thing about what he said, because it means that we'll be able to build more uh, kind relations with each other, more open, more understanding relations with each other. More, people, honest, relations, more yeah. honest relations, exactly. And also it will lead the way for societal atonement, which I think is important. And you look at, say, uh, the period after the Second World War when people from the Commonwealth came here, you know, you had Windrush, but prior to Windrush, there's a, a, a real lack of understanding of what led people mm. to be here in the first place. And so I think that the kind of society that we can build, it's one that not only exists in as just a way as possible with each other, but also exists in as just and functional way uh, as possible with nature, rather than seeing nature as something we are at war with, one of the, as a species. I want to ask about the war on terror, because mm. one, of the, one of the issues I most associate your music with, I think probably most of your most successful tracks are critical in some way of the war on terror, got abomination, mm. uh, terrorist. Okay, well what I would say is that in 2003 you had the largest mobilization of human beings on the globe simultaneously that has ever taken place. You had the most opposed war probably in the history of the mm. human race that ever took place. And Jeremy Corbyn was at the forefront of that campaign. Now, that was a perfect example of inverted totalitarianism, whereby we live in a democracy, right? So why is it the democratic expression of so many people within this society was absolutely completely ignored mm -hmm. for this mass projection of very sophisticated forms of murder? Um, and the point I'm trying to make by pointing at that is that Jeremy is an anti-imperialist, but he's an anti-imperialist from a position of logic and rational mm -hmm. interrogation and investigation of what are the pros, cons, what are the material uh, results and ramifications of this action. And I think that when people are really given the choice and mm -hmm. given the facts and clearness in a very clear, um, unambiguous way, they come to similar, generally, generally people will come to similar conclusions mm. about it. So in terms of what you're talking about, the deeper state, when we were talking about the intelligence, the, I mean... It was, well, the media as well, the right? Me the, the, they'll, they'll jump on you in a second the minute you question the media, British media, you know, he, he is proof that the media is losing power, man. Mm -hmm. He is proof that the media is not the litmus test for what can and can't happen anymore. I mean, I suppose the people who are, who are providing the Corbyn surge, yeah. the young. Yeah. I mean, what newspaper do they read? They don't, yeah. They're not even interested in The Guardian, let alone the Daily Telegraph or, or the yeah. Daily Mail. That's not where we get our news from. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. so to finish us off. Yes. We've talked about a lot of long-term issues, mm -hmm. why you're supporting Corbyn, mm -hmm. what, what kind of vision he offers. Obviously, mm -hmm. we're not having this interview on any day. Yeah. We're two days until a general election. People will mm -hmm. be watching this the day before the general election, yeah. maybe on the day of the general election. I want you to finish on mm -hmm. why the audience mm -hmm. should care, what the audience should be thinking today, what the audience should be doing today. Right. Okay, so moment. what I would say that this campaign has uh, really revealed is that we are actors as we have never been before within this process, that we have within our ability um, a function of galvanizing, of mobilizing other people, we are able to organize on a grassroots level. The biggest gift of this campaign, whether we succeed or not, which we will succeed, is confidence it has given people. It has essentially revitalized so many people I know who have been left jaded and disenchanted by all of the disappointments, by all of the repression, by all of the pushback, by all of the backlash of the last few years, by the, the, the 
uh, and non, uh, anonymity of corporate uh, uh, hegemony. I have seen people absolutely revitalized. And the most important thing is that we use that to push us and thrust us and enable us to um, essentially proselytize, essentially uh, bring people together to direct them to the polling station, to personally take them to the polling station. Have those conversations with people in your family. Have those conversations with people that seem on the fence. Have those conversations with people who have allowed themselves essentially to you know, fall victim to the propaganda, to the mantras that are repeated, unelectable, unsustainable, untenable. Combat that. Arm yourself with ways to argue against it. Be absolutely clear. Have clarity in the argument that you are presenting to them. Convince them with clear arguments that regard the material lived realities. Use examples from their own lives. Use examples from the lives of people they love and make clear to them that this will be the difference. This will be the difference. And this is not me trying to dramatize it or, or go over the top. It will be the, the difference between people dying that don't actually have to die. That is the reality of this. And that's what Jeremy has been able to communicate throughout this uh, campaign by the fact that legally they've had to give him equal time to represent himself. These are the points we need to emphasize. We need to be absolutely clear and steadfast. And uh, like I say, take everyone you know to the polling station on the 8th of June and let's do this. Let's make this happen. I feel inspired. I was already motivated. <laughs> nice and one. I feel more inspired now. Respect. Thank you so much Respect. for joining us. Thank you, bro. We'll have you on nice very one. soon. Wicked. <laughs>